Speak at that microphone. No, that's that's going to pick them up in the space. Like okay. So when you're speaking, please um, uh, identify yourself. That's that's all we ask. That uh, identify yourself and, and just in and be conscious of the fact that the if uh, these things move better if if your remarks are unique as opposed to repeating what somebody else has said over and over again. Um, this is an informational meeting for everybody, for you, for us. It's, it's we try to figure out what the future is of this this act this building that actually I think I, I think I can safely say that we all share. Um, as I start with my introduction, I'll have everyone introduce themselves. Starting with the city council side over here, starting at this end of the table. David, would you be so kind? I'm David Murphy, councilor Ward. Gene Casey, Ward Seven. This is in my ward. City councilor Mary Emma Barge from Ward Six. Look right. Uh, Mayor David Narkowitz. I'm Doug Lou, I'm running for the committee. Good morning, Scanlon. I'm a uh, community member of the committee and a uh, neighbor and a uh, local uh, business person. I'm Richard Cooper. I'm Cooper's College on State Street and a graduate of this school. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Sat in that front. Principal's office. <laughs> Just overseeing. And I'm Tom Smith. I'm a I'm a resident of the neighborhood. The committee that just introduced themselves was established for the purposes of, of expanding the conversation and input. It's a citizens ad hoc committee, as you, as you noted. And um, where we find ourselves today is that the school department has considered the surplusing of this building. And so far, and part of the, the motivation for the conversation is the city uh, while good at many things, being a landlord is not particularly it's within its best skill set. And, and as such, it is, it is a serious consideration of um, surplusing this building and making it available for um, purchase and, and or investment. So with that said, um, I, Mayor, do you want to you do, do you feel any other story on this or history? No? Is there anything else? The, the ad hoc committee, does anyone want to speak to that, to these points, or should we just get right to questions? I would just add that there's two other graduates of the school at this table as well. Down this end over here. <laughs> so we, have, we actually have three graduates of Florence graduates. And parents of graduates. And parents. And parents of graduates. And, and it should be said that uh, with all these discussions historically in Northampton and any other community, when you're discussing the, the transition of a, of a school property, you're talking about a, a, a cultural center, community center, and a, a, a point of sentiment and nostalgia that, that even, even if you suffered in the school, as, as Rich Cooper clearly did in the, in the principal's <laughs> office, the fact is that this, 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 this building holds a special place in, in, in that informs a lot of people's conversations. So. Um, so please, anyone want to start off with questions, recommendations, suggestions, discussion points? You can just speak there, that's fine. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Michael Keeney. I am the chairperson of a group that meets on the second floor and um, the president of the Bridge Road. And um, our group uh, has no uh, set of opinions as far as to what the city does with the property. We trust you to make your own decisions. Um, as a member of the group and a neighbor, I can say that 60 to 80 people per day um, use the facility. So it's a very vibrant and important cultural center for us. And um, as far as just the accommodations and the management, uh, I think to a person, uh, the, the members of the group really appreciate the space, the management, and so on and so forth. So it's a very high value to own that 60 to 80 people per day. That's really all I have to say. Say sixty to eighty people in your group. Yes. Okay. Per day. Per day. Seven days a week. Yeah. Thank you. Mary. Uh, my name is Mary Casper. My son graduated from the school, and I was part of the group that took over this building when it was declared. It wasn't declared surplus when they closed the home experience. And that was at the behest of Mayor Mary Ford, who got a group of us together who worked for the city and we also were residents of Florence and other concerned citizens. From that group, we formed something called the Friends of the Florence Community Center, which ran the building for, I think, almost 10 years. Um, we knew at the time that the school department did not want to release the building, so we really took over a caretaker role more than anything. When the city first took over the building, they didn't really have a plan for closing it down, and the, the basement was flooded twice, the boiler burned out. It really needed to take care of it, which, which we did as a nonprofit. We were able to get, um, Linda Desmond was the council of board five at the time, and she was on the board. Ray Ella Brook ran the rec department, he was on the board. Larry Connor, a couple of other community people. So we got a ten thousand, I believe it was a ten thousand dollar grant from the city to fix the boiler. And after that, we didn't come back to the city. We really ran it as a self-sustaining building based on the rents that were coming in. We were very lucky to get two Commonwealth Service Corps workers, so we didn't have to pay for staffing, and they could handle the booking of the space. We always saw it as a community space. And I think it served that function really well. It didn't cost us as much to maintain because our time was volunteer. We had a uh, contract services worker who came in and managed the building but was not a full-time employee. So we were really able to do it with very little money. But we did make enough money through rent, especially using the auditorium as well as part of that, to keep the building going. Um, when the school department decided that they wanted to bring the um, alternative high school back here, we gave it back to the school committee and we disbanded the organization. But I'd like to say that it really has served the community really well. This is one of the only auditoriums in any city school. Um, the arts community in particular has been able to make use of the building as have small businesses. I see someone here who is one of our first tenants and has been here since the 90s. And right. Was able to stay in business, I think, because the rates, rates were always reasonable. People, Richard has a studio here, has been here for many, many years, and has invested a lot in his studio and his equipment. And I would like to see a community use. I understand that the city doesn't want to you know, keep up the building, but what happened with South Street School was that a nonprofit came in and was able to manage that building, put a lot of money into it. I'd like to see something similar happen to here, or at least that be on your mind. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Muller, and um, I am a resident of the community. I live down on Nanatuck Street, and I've lived here for 34 years in the same house. <laughs> um, I guess I just have watched all the changes that happened in the, in the uh, grammar school and then moving to the uh, community center and over the you know decades or a couple decades or so that um, this has been a community center I've personally used the facility for you know a half a dozen you know community connections that I've been involved with and continue to do so on a regular basis and you know I think that it's very important to acknowledge um, 
uh, uh, sort of a, to value the retention of a neighborhood and sub-community identity within the city and the richness that that brings. And I think that this has just been a real kind of gateway for involvement of you know, people that aren't always um, fully franchised in the community to have, um, to have a kind of sense of place and a way and a mechanism to get involved in the city in other ways. Um, I think it's, I meant to kind of go online and research all of the, um, uh, the strategic plan values of the city and the different plans that have been done recently, but uh, my guess is that the notion of sort of preserving this as, um, as a kind of a center, uh, one of the centers of the community uh, is certainly aligned with many of those principles because in, in some interesting way it's just become a, a whole other uh, kind of heartbeat and extension of, of downtown Florence, which I think is extremely rich. Um, it's within walking distance, it's got kind of green principles, it's, it's, at a, it's no accident that it's at the gateway of a number of uh, roads that, that come into Florence and then enter into downtown Northampton proper. Um, and I just want like to echo Mary that, uh, you know, we're a rich, diverse, creative group of people who use this building, who come not just from Florence um, Village, but from the adjoining, you know, sub areas. And I would just love to see an opportunity um, for us to plan and think through what are ways that we could you know, address and respond realistically to the needs of the city. I understand the upkeep um, and maintenance of the building is probably paramount, and then secondary is you not wanting to be in a position of owning buildings. But I think it's just really important to um, to give people time to reactivate and, and sort of think through what would be a strategies and to look at, and it's a very difficult time for funding, but I'm also a um, grant writer and have been known to pro bono my <laughs> services. Um, and I just think that, I just, I'm really grateful that you're here listening and I trust that it's a real listening for different possibilities and not like, hurry up, we have to like resolve this problem immediately because I think that it's just what goes on here is way too rich to just throw away um, in a, you know, a couple of committee meetings that uh, uh, focus on, you know, practicality, which I'm not, Trying to diminish. I'll pass it. <laughs> I'm Amelia Adams. I'm the executive director of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. We've been in this building uh, for over 10 years, uh, being relocated up here after we left our office space in downtown Northampton. When we moved in here, it was so hard to get in here that we actually had to share space with another organization that did direct service with clients. So we had this sort of uh, office schedule where they got the office half the day and I got the other half of the day. They eventually moved to a new location and we got to roost down in the corner in the basement for a number of years and then eventually had the chance to move upstairs and are in a beautiful classroom, uh, which serves our organization extremely well. First of all, I've got to echo the sense of community involvement and the number of people who wander in and out of the doors here every week. With Habitat schedule, I'm here sometimes Sunday morning at 7 o'clock, Thursday night at 7 p.m. The range of activity that happens here almost around the clock is extraordinary. Uh, and the number of people that this gentleman was referring to is really true. You get here at 7 o'clock in the morning, the parking lot is full. You have to park in Park Cellar Street. So there's a lot of community activity that does happen here. The other thing that it is, it's a real affordable place for people to get their foot in the door. A number of nonprofits get started here in Mulvan. I happen to stay here because I think it's the best location in the world for us. Uh, but it's a real functional space for nonprofits to get going. And it's hard to find affordable nonprofit office space that is, that is somewhat tied to services. We do have a bus route, but there is that sense of community that comes in and out the door and that pulls people into the activities that are here. Valley Free Radio, uh, the groups that meet here, people coming up for orientation and habitat. There's all sorts of people coming in and out of this building all the time. The arts communities that use it, the uh, teachers, the yoga folks, there's just so much activity here that it's really a little buzz of community, and I, I would hate to lose it. The the other thing that I, I want to I mean, recognize that the city is is not always best at being landlords, but I think you guys have been terrific landlords here. I've got to say your staff has been responsive. 
that um, we've had problems with our building, our, our offices, that your staff have been very responsive, and, and we appreciate it. We know that our, our rent is very affordable. We, we appreciate that very much, but we also want to respect and honor the fact that we think you've been pretty good landlords. At least that's been my experience. Um, the other thing that I think is important, too, is that I've lost my train of thought. <laughs>
Um, the school department has now surplused the building to the city. They've said they no longer have a use for it, so they no longer control it. And so we want to find out what, um, you know, what the future use of it is. But those are some of the major issues that are facing the building. And I'm, I'm happy to recognize David or Mike, or if, um, if you want to chime in or add to any of that. No, I think that's a, that's a fairly uh, succinct synopsis as far as you know, what, what the plant issues are here. Um, I mean, basically, if, if we were going to maintain and continue to use the building uh, between the boilers, uh, some environmental issues, energy efficiency issues, as well as access. Uh, as the mayor said, we'd be looking at having to put an elevator in, uh, convert the bathrooms on the second floor for handicap access to truly meet the, the ADA codes. Um, and the, the numbers, uh, there are a lot of digits that go with those numbers. So just to sort of continue to use the building, structurally it's a sound, it's a fortress. And we've got to move the building structurally. Uh, it's just that we're looking at a lot of, because of its age, needs uh, that would have to be addressed as we move forward that we couldn't enjoy. So do you want to just recognize Susan Wright, who, who can talk about the, probably the financial picture? Yeah, um, I just wanted to bring out so that people understand the income from the building in fiscal 12, which ended June 30th, was about 98299 and the expenses for the building were 98823 So we're really, we're right at a break-even proposition right now with the rents the way they are. And what that, what those expenses amount to is electricity is about $10,000 a year, oil is about $35,000 a year, water and sewer about $4,000, and then the labor is about thirty-five for the custodial for the building. And that leaves a maintenance budget for all the other things, about 15000 so we don't have um, a lot of depth as far as where we can go if we do run into a major maintenance problem. So right now we're about breaking even, rents are covering the cost of running the building, and that's if nothing major big happens as far as repairs. Just a clarification, is the, this floor here fully rented up since the school moved up? No, no, we have not been able to rent some of this just in part due to the uncertainty of the building. Nobody wants to move their business here if they don't know how long they will be able to rent. So there are four, four, or, five. four or five more spaces that, that could be rented. Um, you sir first, you have the Oh, I'm um, I heard what you said about the city not being a good landlord. The building looks better than it did when our kids went there in the 80s, but I, it helped to have some financial information and I'm glad to hear that the building is breaking even, but do you have any quantification of what it would cost to bring the building up to code? That's question number one. Question number two is why aren't this building eligible for CPA funds? I see what the city did with the academy. I mean, the academy music got hundreds of thousands of dollars from the marquee, for the doors, and for, the, for energy efficiency, and that's been a beautiful result. Why couldn't that money be applied here if it's or two hundred thousand dollars. I've seen the grants that size go through. And I'm not going to repeat what everyone else says about the best use of this building because I think everyone here is going to speak in favor of what this does for the community. But I think the public would need to know if we're hearing big numbers, how big are they, and do we have other sources to keep this building alive? That's uh, that's a fair question, and I'm Mary, because I heard that as a question also. David, you you feel comfortable giving some ballpark figures on that? Sure. Um, if you look at uh, again, these are what are called budget. These are called what are called budget estimates. Uh, so in other words, we don't have firm quotes. There's no firm architectural engineering studies that have been done. Uh, but what we're looking at uh, for an elevator, the boiler work. Asbestos abatement for the boilers, uh, security system, windows, uh, handicapped access uh, for the bathrooms on the second floor, uh, the site drainage work that the mayor alluded to with the water that comes in during the summer months when we get severe thunderstorms, uh, work on the parking lot because we have to basically repave that lot or we're going to lose it. Um, we're talking about somewhere in the range of $1 to $1.2 million. That's to do everything. 
Uh, and the other thing you need to keep in mind that any work that would be done in this building, because it's municipal work, we'd be looking at paying prevailing wages. Uh, so, which are union level wages, not the wages you'd be paying for carpenters to come and work in your business or your house. So that is a great inflator to what we're looking at as potential costs to do all the work in the building. So we're somewhere in that a million to 1.2 range at this point with, with budget numbers only. Um, just, just in terms of the CPA question, um, I have to research that. I don't know if this would qualify as a historic uh, structure. I mean, it may be historic in terms of Florence, but in terms, it, it, I, I, I would have to research that question, whether it would qualify to the level that something like the Academy, which is on the National Historic Register, or Forbes. Uh, we can certainly research that. Um, whether or not this would qualify, I don't know. But we'll, that's that's a great suggestion. We can research that. It was just a point of information that we made this first floor handicapped accessible through community development block grant funds, uh, in part because we had a teen center and we had elder services <coughs> were working out of the building, so that qualified the building. We never had enough money, obviously, to put in the elevator, but we did get the waiver to do it for the first floor, and, that, and we got the bathroom stuff at the same time. We also redid the parking lot, and I'm pretty sure it was Richie Parasoletti who did the parking lot. So it was, you know, the city was very cool. Priming them to manage the city streets eventually. Yes. Uh, it should be also noted that the CDB uh, community development block grant funds um, are federal dollars that are given to the community to, to invest, reinvest and it, consequently, they are also the first thing that everyone hacks before it gets to the city. And our, our portion of CDBG funds has been reduced substantially from the time when, so we've actually gone way down from the time that you, you were making appeals back when we were giving much larger grants for projects like that. And, this, and, and right now we have a lot of block grant funds already tied into some projects that are already been there. That we were paying off now. That would not be the panacea, I'm afraid. It, it, it might be able to supplement, but it's it's not. It's unfortunately not the answer that it used to be. Any other any other thoughts, questions? Please, because this is the MJ, and then back to you. Just a quick question. Just what's your committee time frame? I mean, I know you were having an appraisal done on the property uh, this fall. Um, do you have any sort of sense of your own time in terms of moving forward with public discussion and decision points? We, we, as I understand, there is no deadline. Right? There's no deadline. In fact, actually, we've been committed from the start of this to fully vet and investigate every the best use for this property. That's our intent. And the liquidating it, uh, I mean, you know, the sort of Damocles is any major uh, structural calamity that may be visited, in which case then it might, might be forcing the issue a little quicker. But the fact is that it's, what started this process is what the mayor said was the school department's decision to no longer um, retain this property. So it goes back to the city to figure out what's the, what is the best use. And part of the impetus of the discussion is, is of course, and it hasn't been mentioned, but I think it's hanging out there, is that this property's off the tax rolls. The, the, uh, we're under a lot of pressure here to generate revenue for the community. And possibly, the, we're also investing in the prospect of putting this back on the tax rolls as a, as a, as a private fund, private fund. Can, can I just add, Please. so we did, we did, the committee did vote to, um, to, to uh, uh, order an appraisal, to do an appraisal. I think one of the things that we're hoping, we, we've asked the appraiser to look at are what 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 could be a, a kind of a best use for a facility like this. Um, so we're trying to get sort of an understanding of um, of what those potential uses could be. So um, just so that we have that context as we come up with whatever uh, RFP or whatever, whatever decision that the, the committee comes up with. And I want to assure everyone, the fix is not in. There is no particular project in mind. We are not, we're, I mean, in fact, actually, I think I can safely say that everyone here shares your same interest and in, in desire to maintain this as a, 
was a community asset and, and hub. And we're not in it to make a turnaround for a quick buck, but, the, but, the, but I'm glad that you, you're having the opportunity to understand the pressures that we're at at this point. So. Oh, yeah. And we'll let yeah. Gene do that. Also, I believe we have the guideline for uh, whether there's a timeline, we have structured the leases to be short term, is that correct? Right now, the leases are running on fiscal year. One year leases and they come up June 30th every year. I have a great emotional sentimental attachment to this building, by the way. <laughs> I know that every upstate by Rich Cooper. I think I spent more time in the principal's office right here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're setting a very good example for any students in the bank. And if we're saying they're city officials and, and, Thank you. and great leaders here, we're spending most of the time in the office. Yeah. Oh, Mary, I'm sorry. Mary, I want to thank you for being here. I worked very close with Mary Casper as the property committee several, several years ago, Alex Giesland and I, and I think Linda Desmond was with us also. And there has been a problem. Even when our former, former mayor, Mary Ford, of what we did with the building, we did the best that we could. And then even with Mary Claire Higgins, the issue kept coming up about the cost and the upkeep of this building. And I know your group did a wonderful job because you really took a lot of pressure off the city and it was really an honor that we worked with you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michelle Ryan, I'm an owner and operator of Florence Yoga up on Sweet 12. And I welcome you all to come to the yoga classroom sometime. And some of my students Students and Sweetie shown up as well to show their support for this building and space. And uh, I just want to say I opened in 2009. I'm one of the more tenants in the building and started from really nothing. I had a couple of students in the whole town supported it. And I wanted to open a yoga studio uh, teaching the yoga that I do. It wasn't in the shop, it was in Northampton. And actually, the closest studio that teaches, I know there's a lot of studio yoga studios in Northampton, but the closest one um, to my studio that teaches. So there is, an, I have a lot of people that come from Keene, New Hampshire, Brattleboro, Vermont, West Hartford, Connecticut, to come and actually come in to take yoga with my, my students, my teachers, and myself, because it's not really offered anywhere else around here. And when they come, they're not only just coming into the class and going home, they're going downtown, they're having lunch, they're shopping. So they come and they actually experience my family as a whole, actually, to yoga class. And since I've opened it, I've had about 600 students come through, and I have about 50 regular students now. We have 14 classes a week, and I get about an average of about 12 people per class. So, which is pretty good. After three years, I'm really proud of that. It's a beautiful space. I love my little school room. I love my chalkboards. <laughs> I still have the chalkboards. We use them all the time. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time and money getting it into a great space, and I really appreciate it. I want to stay here. Uh, and as a small business owner, it's been really great for me to be able to have a place that has free parking, because that's so unheard of in Northampton. Uh, that's convenient. It's on bus routes. I have people that bike on the bike trail and come. And we got a, a bike rack a couple of years ago, because I had a couple of students were asking for that. So it's been a great experience for me to be here. And Mike, Dean, and Darlene have always been so responsive, and I'm appreciative of that. And I can't reiterate I won't reiterate about the whole community thing. We all get it, it's a community space, but it's also a small incubator space. And that's what I think is an opportunity for economic development as part of your mandate is, as leaders of the city is to help foster economic development and community development. And have you considered a small incubator space here, a small business incubator space? That's a possibility that's here uh, and can be utilized um, so I think that's just something I want to throw on the table. And again, I'm going to take over the class. There's one six. And your next. Hi, um, I'm Christy Spain. Um, I've lived here 10 years. Um, I was involved for a number of years with um, the dance studio upstairs, Studio Frenzy. Um, I don't know if Emily is here, um, but you know, it's a, a place of a lot of different kinds of uh, dance activity and yoga, um, but I just wanted to mention um, from a broader kind of political perspective, uh, when I got out of college, 
way back when. Uh, we still had a, a lot of support for the arts. Uh, as a dancer, there was a dance touring program in this, com in this country where uh, any college could pay one third of the cost of bringing a dance company into a performance. And the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, would pay the other two thirds. The, as we know, support for the arts in this country has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. Uh, and it just occurred to me sitting here that um, the model of, of uh, support your local business and support your local culture, and I've taken a vow this Christmas, I'm finding all my gifts locally, not going to big box stores, you know, and this growing awareness of how do you keep the vitality of support in a relationship with your locality, that maybe that works two ways. And that as this building is a prime illustration of community support for many creative endeavor, endeavors like poetry, I'd like to invoke the name of Carl Russo with his poetry show on uh, Valley Free Radio and many things like that that go on in this building that are not money makers, but as a society as a whole, we don't we we do care. We care. We do value the arts. In Ireland, for example, they didn't have money to pass out to support artists. Their version of support was if you're an artist or a writer, you don't pay income tax. That's their gift. You know, every society finds some way to support the creative endeavors. I don't mean just artists for their own expression, but in this building, not that there's painters here, I don't know if there are, but this is a building also devoted to helping people like have their own radio show or have a dance class, have the general population as easy access to the arts in their own life at whatever level. So I was just want, sorry for rambling, I just wanted to throw out an idea I don't know about finances, but it seems we're at a new point in history of localities looking at capitalism in a new way of keeping that capital local and looking also at necessary thinking about the future like the solar um, solar heating instead of oil. Oil is a dinosaur. You know, there are many this problem that we're facing could actually be a creative opportunity for us to look at how can we, as a big family, as this town, save the building, support the stuff that's going on here, maybe, maybe, maybe there's grants for changing to solar, maybe we can do huge fundraisers on an annual basis to pay for Elevators, I mean, maybe we can help in the way Mary's team helped. Maybe there's a new version of a community team to take it off your backs. But uh, if the committee was to put the RFP towards a community purpose rather than for the financial purpose, we'd be very interested in putting an RFP in. And we would operate the uh, the building as a social enterprise, and uh, with hopefully the you know the community to benefit, um, but also the commerce generated from the building would go directly to support the Northampton Public Schools. Uh, and we would try to leverage whatever we could through grant writing, etc., to uh, to make uh, to make this. So, um, you know, if there was anybody that might want to have further discussions on that, I'd be happy to engage in that. And uh, I look forward to see where the RFP would be leading us. Uh, clarification in terms of an RFP is a request for proposals. It's something that we have to draft up. And when we do this, if, if we um, dispose of this building, we send out a request for proposals. And Jim is referring to if we get to 
draft the language. Uh, our best, it depends our best wishes reflected in the RFP. Uh, the gentleman sitting next to you is next. Uh, hi, my name is Rob Kimmel. Um, I am a, a new transplant, so I can I can speak for Florence temporarily. I've been here for less than a year, but uh, I, so I, I bought a house here in Florence, you know, very deliberately. Um, I have a kid who lives in Jackson Street. I moved here from from Brooklyn, where I was for 15 years, and uh, this this space reminds me a lot of what things were like in Brooklyn before, and there's a lot of energy and a lot of dynamism that's happening in, in Brooklyn, which I, I'm speaking of just because I'm you know familiar with that. Um, and a lot of it was like public-private coalitions and partnerships that generated uh, things for for lots of different segments of the population and generated a lot of money. I'm a graphic designer. So my life sits at the cross section of, of like art, commerce, um, and education. So, so from from that point of view, I see this place as being an amazing opportunity. And uh, one of the reasons that we moved to Florence instead of somewhere else in like downtown was that there seemed like a lot of things about to happen here. And uh, I got a plot of the community garden over here, which was fantastic. And being part of that and seeing how, how really well run that was and how many different people were participating and giving real talent to, uh, to that, that action and seeing it grow gives me real hope that Florence is different than, than downtown Northampton. It's maybe a place for spaces like this to really you know, create this like alternative space and not just, you know, the, the political aspect of it, the social aspect is great, but I'm also, I mean, I'm a capitalist, you know, I believe in, in business too. And I think that this is a good place for, for all of that to kind of flourish. And so having a kid at Jackson Street, he can ride his bike from our house to school, which is magnificent. And have a place that's kind of the, the street level culture I'm, I'm used to. And this too is an easy bike ride for kids. And I can see this being a great opportunity to, to have classes, to have not for profits, and to have small businesses. And uh, I, I think that can share the space. I think this having these walls here and the, the modest amount of money that it sounds, because a million dollars doesn't sound like that much in the grand scheme of things. Um, I think that could be raised through uh, you know, different channels. Even if even the federal government says no, you know, we don't give money to art anymore. I think there's other ways to, to get that money from, from different levels or just like funding. But a million dollars seems like a small cost to pay to, to have this you know, in the city's uh, portfolio of cool spaces. And uh, so, I, so I used to teach at Pratt, and I know that in the 70s, Pratt owned an enormous amount of structures around their campus and sold them when the neighborhood looked like it didn't care. And uh, those all became condos and things like that, and were lost. And then when, uh, when kind of that heat energy came back to, to Pratt and wanted to expand, they had to build new buildings, and it cost an enormous amount of money to do that. And, uh, and they lost touch with you know, something that could have been part of the community. They sold it for a short-term gain, um, and it would be a shame if something a space like this uh, fell victim to that as well. So that's, that's my question. Uh, yes, you uh, I just have one comment to make. Uh, my name is James Ryan. I'm uh, Michelle's husband. Uh, and when I think about this space, and I understand the pressure the city is under to turn things that are not paying taxes over the tax rolls. But at the same time, when you're looking at these businesses, and I don't know who these tenants are in these buildings or in this building, but a lot of them are small, very small businesses that barely make a profit. And these same people would not be in business in downtown Northampton because they can't afford the rent. So what happens is if this becomes a condominium complex, generates cost, you know, taxes back to the city, become some type of office building privately owned, you're gonna you're gonna stunt growth of small businesses. I know the yoga studio upstairs would not be open today. There's probably other businesses here that would not be open today because <clears throat> the rent that's paid here, these same businesses can't pay in downtown. And I think for that reason, uh, people who have some entrepreneurial spirit need, need a space like this. And I think there's some obligation from the city of Northampton 
to try to preserve that opportunity for for people in and, and outside the city that if he or she wants to get into business. And I think it's it's probably a little bit uh, it'd be a little bit easy to say, listen, we gotta put this back in the tax roll. We can't afford a million or a million two. Uh, I agree with the gentleman from Pratt. A million dollars. A million dollars is a lot of money. You can you know, buy a two-family house in, in, in Northampton, it's two or three hundred thousand. So a million bucks it sounds like a lot of money to people who can barely pay the rent. But I don't think a million dollars is um, is a big enough price tag to to, to send this to a private entity. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Michael Liu, um, Florence resident, I'm a landscape architect in the city. Um, there's been a lot of good comments from me already. You know, I'm not going to repeat all, all of them, um, but I just want to say this is just such a tremendous resource, a community asset. It's got such great visibility and accessibility, it's so easy. <coughs> um, I want to speak about you know, my experience with this building on a very personal level. Um, I've been um, going to Michelle's yoga studio for just over a year consistently. Um, you know, I turned to yoga to help me uh, battle my decades long issues with back problems, etc. And um, I've gotten much more out of it. Um, I've come to realize that I, this is a place where um, I spend probably the fourth most amount of time in my week. Um, I'm here uh, regularly three or four times a week and sometimes five times um, during the week. And um, somebody else had mentioned all the people that come and go. Every time I come here, whether it's in the morning or evening uh, or during the day, which is rare because I work a regular kind of eight to five type job, but I see all sorts of people here uh, there's always activity here. Um, I think it could be more vibrant. I hate, I, you know, we all understand what pressure the city's under, um, but I think I just, you know, I hate to see this turned over to like a private type developer uh, that would consider changing this to condos or office space. I think this incubator space is, is a tremendous resource for the city, um, especially for Florence, and I hope that if an RFP goes out, um, that you know there could be some type of first priority given to somebody that would want to or have interest in keeping um, this facility as you know that type of small business starter type space, which I think is is really needed in, in you know every community. So I'm interested to see you know how things go and if the need arises and um, if somehow I can donate my professional design services. Or drainage problems, maybe you've already got that figured out. Accessibility issues on the exterior. Um, I would be more than happy to um, donate my time. I've been involved in several projects uh, where I've donated my time to manpower at Jackson Street School with a couple projects, so German Truth Memorial. Um, uh, I can't think of some of the others, but I've been involved in several other uh, pro bono type um, activities in the city, and I'd be happy to. Um, be involved here as well. Um, my name is Peg Whittem and I've just, I've been living in Florence for about 35 years and I just came to hear what people had to say and what's running through my mind right now is the potential for this building to be a vibrant place, the potential for this building to be an inclusive place. If I go downtown in Northampton and and I, I love Northampton, but if I go downtown Northampton, it's pretty homogenous. It's pretty all the same. And I think that here in Florence, the diversity and the different financial levels of the people all still are able to live together. I mean, I think of Pivot Media, and I mean, this fellow moved and, you know, he's, he's in a new place, but I think the the accessibility in Florence to people who are just starting out, to businesses that are just starting out, to, to really 
encourage this whole diversity of, of occupation, this whole diversity of, of what people need and, and how Florence or this place can um, supplement their needs. I mean, to me, this is what I'm thinking, that this is a unique place and can still be run as a unique place. Um, right now, Northampton's put hundreds of thousands of, of CPA money into their recreation, into their fields, into their bike paths, and maybe it's time for them to look at existing buildings within the city that they can, that they can um, support to.
the design work of what we, we kind of know what has to happen. It's really um, having the funding to be able to pay for it. Um, and I'm not, uh, and given licensing around elevators, for example, it's not really something I think we could have volunteer labor for because we have to have, they're, they're licensed and inspected. We're talking about windows. Exactly, yeah. I understand. Yeah, I get that, but I just mean some of the structural stuff would be difficult to do. But, but I understand what you're suggesting, and we can certainly look at that. I just, uh, Mary, you had said that you had volunteer custodial help. No, we had we had a, uh, a former state employee who was going to state that <coughs> was only allowed to work for another hours, um, and he worked as a contract laborer. He set his own hours. He brought his own tools. So we were able to legally pay him as a contract we didn't have to pay the restriction. So we could that, that could possibly happen again. It could, but I have to say that it took, I think, four years to get the federal government to recognize us as a nonprofit. The state did it in the first year, but Linda Desmond spent a, quite a bit of time making the argument that we were using it for a nonprofit mm -hmm. basis because in fact we were almost subsidizing the rents mm -hmm. and that was part of the issue and we had a team said we had a number of other reasons but it was it, it took an effort to get them to grant us nonprofit status. Um, uh, I've been handed a letter here with, for the purpose of reading the public record uh, some uh, uh, someone wasn't able to be here today. Hello, I live in Florence, a short distance from the former grammar school, which is now the Florence Community Center. I go to the building once or twice a week to attend classes at the Movement Innovations on the third floor. This is a letter from Martha Bishop. Um, and she said, I live in Florence, a short distance from the former grammar school, which is now the Florence Community Center. I go to the building once or twice a week to attend classes at Movement Innovations on the third floor. It's a wonderful building. I really enjoy being in, our, in it on a regular basis. I look forward to being in that space. It's one of the things that motivates me to go to Pilates class. On my way to class, I remember how lovely it is to go there and somehow forget that there is a grueling workout in it. I also see by taking the stairs up to the third floor that there are several nonprofits and other small businesses using the building. There are not a lot of places in Florence for small businesses to incubate and grow. It's really nice to see them here. I also know that community groups use the auditorium. It's terrific to have this resource for the community to use. I know you are holding a public meeting next Tuesday to discuss the future of the building. I'm not able to attend the meeting. I'm hoping to take my comments into consideration as I'm a citizen of Florence and someone who uses that building regularly. Sincerely, Martha Bishop, uh, Florence, Massachusetts. So that, and that was for the purposes of uh, the public record. Um, anyone else have? Yeah, I just have some questions. Well, uh, let me let me defer to someone who hasn't spoken yet, and then we're back to you. Again, so. Hi. My name is Brett Foreman. Uh, I run the administrative offices for the Shang Tsung Institute and at the medical uh, uh, med alternative medical school, um, which is a part of the institute's uh, efforts to preserve Tibetan culture. And um, one of the uh, most impressive parts of being affiliated with this building is that it was immediately uh, understood that there was a lot of creative energy going on here. Um, the tenants in general were uh, uh, artistically inclined, um, socially inclined, uh, and seemed to have the community's uh, best interests in mind. And I'm just wondering, um, as I'm listening to the group here in the room, uh, if, and, and the fact that we're here together uh, in the hall seems to indicate that there might be a possibility of, of coming together somehow a little bit more formally as a, as a group rather than, you know, as a, a city and its tenants um, to maybe, you know, instigate some sort of collaborative effort uh, to keep the, uh, uh, well, to meet the needs that, that are, uh, the building's facing at the moment. Um, just knowing that uh, 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 it, it's going to take a certain amount of a dollar amount uh, to get things uh, put right and even entertain the idea of, of continuing um, 
maybe there might be some brainstorming between the, the tenants and the city as far as how to increase revenue uh, for the building, probably uh, possibly do some public outreach, uh, um, maybe do some uh, city-sponsored functions that are that uh, benefit the community somehow that would be um, uh, like use of this auditorium. I know that it's dormant uh, a large amount of the time, but maybe there could be some sort of weekly Congress here of some sort uh, of, of you know f films to watch or, or something that might be able to draw a small admissions amount um, uh, and and maybe promote the building a little bit more um, you know as far as the uh, 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 its visibility within the public I, I, I mean nobody's going to come to the party unless they're invited and uh, I know that a lot of people don't know about this except for the outreach that the tenants are doing on behalf of the building for their own, you know, uh, uh, businesses that are conducting here. So I was just wanting to find out if it might be possible to, to organize something that might bring us a little bit closer together as far as the uh, um, brainstorming com committee is concerned. Yeah. To that end, I think that, that uh, well, certainly seems to go several people here in this room to be amenable to that. Right. And, uh, and we are available, and I, I agree with this, this weird arrangement, that, or this formality that we have structured, that, that, that kind of creates this power source disempowered dynamic. That I would, I would you know, I'll do. I, I'd be glad to step on the other side of the table and speak as human being with any group that wants to assemble. And so, uh, it, it, for the purpose of this, the public meeting work. Any nod towards formality, what you're experiencing now, is we're going to stay within that context, but this is not the last conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, business cards and such, and, and we're all available on the website, but, um, and, and, and I believe you have lots of people willing to participate in the same level. So. Mm -hmm. um, so Marianne, uh, actually, we're back with Jackson. Sure. And, and, you know, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the precedent in terms of um, repurposing some of the other schools. I know that um, the community center bought the um, South Street. The, or mu the music center. Music the center, Street I mean. School. And then uh, did the daycare buy Fiker? Or not, not a talk. Not, not a talk. So what happened with the community music center, which okay. was another elementary yep. school, um, actually in my neighborhood that closed. Uh, there was a similar reuse committee that looked yeah. at what, uh, what, whether there was any possible city uses for the building. Um, and then an RFP went out, um, and the, the Northampton Community Music Center uh, leased the space from the city uh, for a minimal amount, a dollar a year. But as part of the lease, they agreed to take on the capital expenses for the building. So they fundraised, they, they restored the physical plant, they, they dealt with the roof and the, the, um, the building issues. Uh, and that lease was recently ex extended even more for them to allow them to, to be able to do even more capital work in the building, which they did in phases. So that's a city-owned building that we leased to that nonprofit um, to be able to carry out their mission um, and then the lease has an ending point in 20 or so years, and there's a right of first refusal of the community music center to have the opportunity to purchase it at that time. So theoretically, in theory, you'd be open to some I, parallel I think, process. I think that's definitely a potential model. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, and the similar Fiker School, Susan, you, you can- Fiker is still, all, still um, in the school department's purview, they never surplused it. They did an RFP process because they wanted to attract a daycare. And then the building was renovated. Um, they spent about $150,000, and the tenant actually paid the debt service for that renovation. So really no city dollars went into it, but the city retains the use of it. We've done two leases. The first was five years. Uh, I think the second lease is what's in effect now. It's about a six-year lease. So, um, could you uh, share with us what the amount of the leases are in both of these buildings, just to uh, give us an idea? Uh, it's a dollar a year for South Street. Mm -hmm. And then Fiker. Uh, Fiker, I think, is about thirteen thousand a year. And, and they and they pay in addition to the thirteen thousand for rent. They pay all utilities, all um, labor costs, and they pay.
pay, um, yeah, they pay the, they pay actual utilities. Same with South Street. Right. I believe. Well, yeah. What's what's the Vernon Street School arrangement? Vernon Street um, is in the process of having a, a lease a lease update at this point. Um, and their current lease or the previous lease was, I think, about a dollar, dollar a month or a dollar a year. Uh, and they're responsible for all improvements. And they used to the property. That's they, have, they have a pretty, pretty big capital expense in the neighborhood. So, so that, and that's a different, different scenario as far as uh, different types of capital needs are just there. So there are definitely models, um, but obviously in the South Street model, which I think has really been a great success, they've paid for all of these um, major capital needs in the building shell. And the, the change we did with the most recent lease was we extended that to the exterior of the, of the property as well. Previously, they were only responsible for the building. We had a major capital need outside the building, a retaining wall that was collapsing. Uh, so when we amended the lease, they agreed to take that on as well. So they rebuilt the parking lot and the retaining wall. And were they obligated to pay prevailing wage? Since you still owned her as a non-profit, profit, were they? Did they not have to? I, I, I have to. I don't think so. They did not pay prevailing wage. I believe because we at least the because we at least the facility to them. So there's a precedent yeah. for that as well. Yeah. David, you add something on no, that? The only building I was going to mention, just to throw it out in the mix, is the Survival Center. Oh, um, we have a 30-year lease with them right now. They did their own capital campaign uh, to do the renovation and expansions that they've done. Um, the city basically still plows the driveway because we have some uh, grounds crew space behind them. But they're responsible for everything for the ensuing 30 years. And Mary, Council of the Bar is before you. Uh, uh, the mayor has answered um, to what I was going to speak about, especially South Street as an example in Pfeiffer. I mean, I don't know if you've been in there, but it's amazing what this group has done. So I would really look at the two options that we were talking about just now. Okay, South Street, how they did it, and also Pfeiffer. And I think. Councilor Dwight, is it the arts looking for a place to work? The Center for the Arts had built into their trans and built into the transition transaction for that was a, a 30 year lease, I think, for um, a public space that was, um, which became the Center for the Arts, and that lease is about to expire. But um, yeah, so that's another consideration. I just wanted to say I was on the South Street School Reuse Committee. And the reason that committee chose to go through those steps was it was very strongly felt in the community that they didn't want to lose the building. A lot of it had to do with losing William Street and was losing uh, with the of that, that building. There was some sense in the community that the city never, never benefited from losing its building. So it was a very strong community sentiment to keep the building. What I don't think people realize is how terrible that building was. You, I mean, there was no roof. Everything had fallen in. It was just an unbelievable mess. But the, the committee wanted to keep that building for educational or cultural uses, and that was how the RFP was, was crafted. But it also was crafted that there was a big financial burden on whoever was coming into that building. And, and they put a tremendous amount of yeah. money in. It was a significant yeah, reinvestment. It was much worse than this building. And it's been great for the neighborhood. It's fabulous. Yeah, I mean, and it's where it's been. But it was really the community that came to that committee and said, we want to keep this. I would also just add that when your committee met, you know, we were still looking for a senior, a senior center was on the radar, the, uh, police station. There were a number of facilities that we still had needs for, and some of those are no longer on the list in terms of what we need as the first <coughs> city. In many cases, we've tried to consolidate and, and sort of, you know, we're not really in expansion mode right now these days, so. Robert, you were next. Well, there is one entity that's still on the list, and that's the uh, Arts Center. I don't know why it's still a place. It would be a natural uh, anchor to still to engage in the type of uh, uh, activity that we had with the Piper School and the South Street School. Um, something got overlooked in the Someone in this committee has put so many scope and problems on the committee. Um, I don't know how that happened. Probably some should have been. Uh, 
I think it was a great building. I'm a, a big proponent of uh, archaic architecture. I run a gas station. And the gas station we've been running 40 years ago. I used to own uh, Ralph's Brothers on, on Maple Street. Um, this building isn't unique as far as an incubator space as far as you need to be people because it's your community. There's probably four or five buildings like this in Florence now. I have a space at uh, 296 North Touch Street, which is very similar to the building. There's Arts and Ministry across the street. Um, my old building, uh, Independence Hall, uh, 30 North Maple Street. So these structures are not really that, that rare in my But this is great for them. It could be a good compliment to the rest of what's going on in Florence. Um, I would say it's building better preserved than it is now. And that's, that's a sad part. Um, from doing a quick numbers crunch, even if this, your organization, your organization, expects this building for nothing, you're probably looking at doubling your rent short of some creative finance. That you are getting it for a dollar. You are getting it for a dollar you're getting now worth that price. You can do the numbers because it's breaking. So, and it needs about a million dollars worth of improvements to be improved properly. And that's something you guys should maybe should look at as a group on forming some sort of alliance. Uh, there is, uh, there is, I think there is an establishment of the, the Arts Trust, and it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to reach out to them and see. I know that they're investigating, I know there were the, the discussions around this building, so uh, looking for a combined space that also involves the Center for the Arts and other arts venues for the community. Uh, yes? Hi, my name is Emma Fox, and I'm a member of the Dance Movement Studio. Popcorn Studio Reds. And um, I have a letter here from one of our members where she echoes a lot of what's been said here, but she mentions another point that I think is really important. She's been part of the studio here since 1995. She's been a performance and movement artist in New York since 1974. And she said that she has watched as one precious space after another has turned from community space into a private office space or condos. And now that the Center for the Arts is going, it's one less space that's available that way. And I just want to point out that part of what's special around here is that we have a reputation as being an arts community. And that's one of the things that draws people here. And you need, just as you need to have incubator spaces for businesses, you also have to have incubator space for the arts. Because as we know, most artists don't have a lot of financial resources. But if we don't have a place for people to develop, develop their work and then have it available for the community, it's not going to be as attractive for people to come and shop in stores and eat at the restaurants and all the other ancillary money that comes into town as a result of that. I'm going to make a couple other comments. Um, we're a break-even venture right now. There's a lot of vacancies in here. If those vacancies were filled and we were getting rent out of those, we would be way beyond break-even. The other thing is that what this building has that's different from all the other spaces in Florence, and there are a bunch right here, this room that we're in right now, this pre auditorium with a beautiful floor, you know, because the Center for the Arts is going out, there are dances that are held there, there's all kinds of stuff going on, and everybody's going, where are we going? What's going to happen now? This is a space which spiffed up just a little bit. Um, and if there's a little more sound insulation, because I know the neighbors across the street have feelings about sound, and I amplified sound after 10 o'clock at night, I'm thinking that this space could be a great resource for those kinds of activities. And the chain, the chain. Thanks. Yeah, I there's a bunch of other tenants uh, that are here at this meeting. And we have also talked as a we had a tenant meeting and also talked that we as tenants are willing to do what it takes to help. So, this is, sorry, this is emotional. This is the homes for businesses. And many of us have been here, I think, almost 10 years. And we have been playing, and our hearts are here. Where we bring a lot of community members here, but this is the second home for many of us, and it means the world for us. So we are really on board. We want to save this. We'll do whatever it takes to, uh, <laughs> to make sure that um, we can save this. We, we want to work with you. Okay, I'm 
Steve Uncle's a long-term tenant, and uh, most of what I was going to say has been said, which is great because we have met before. We got some good ideas out of that, and more ideas tonight. Um, one of the ideas, and it's already been said, is, is to have some kind of an anchor tenant uh, that could make, particularly, I think, use of this room again. It's it's got a lot of unmet potential. We had a chamber music concert in here. And the acoustics are great for that, actually, as long as you've got enough bodies attending to absorb sound. It's great. Um, but anyway, um, so that idea of this sort of anchor tenant, along with the idea, which is kind of a parallel, kind of complementary idea, of what we had 15, 17 years ago, at least when I came here, forming the nonprofit organization, the Friends of the Florence Community Center, I think, well, I know it took the burden off the city as far as being able to handle, and I know that we have tenants now in this place that are willing to step up to the plate and be a part of this process where we could be that nonprofit organization and try to handle matters ourselves as much as possible. Uh, I don't think we're going to pony up the money to buy the place out, right? Okay, but we, the idea of the leasing and everything else that, that happened. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think that potential exists, and especially if within that organization there is a tenant that really has an interest in, say, this area for performing arts, certainly, and whatever else. And I think there's a couple other spaces that could be used for smaller activities, offices, and things. Um, the Center for the Arts being one idea. Also, I happen to know uh, the people in Hadley in that school that's uh, an old school building, North Star. I think they're looking for a new home over there as well. You got renewed? Okay. So, but anyway, I know that if we got the word out, we might be able to click with, with the needs meeting the you know, opportunity here. So. I'd really like to raise that actually, because I thought, um, thinking about sort of solutions to this issue, I thought uh, having a friends of the you know, like our public libraries do is that uh, makes a lot of sense, you know, both for logistical purposes and also, you know, as a way to maintain the space under the auspices of the city. Um, I did want to ask, you know, given all the maintenance uh, issues and coding issues that are causing, you know, something of a crisis, I guess, at the moment, uh, and a lot of which are you know, mandated, mandated either by municipal bylaws or by state and federal law. Um, does that com does that complicate or constrain the city's ability to um, uh, to negotiate renegotiate leases for this space or to uh, hand it off to a different either private entity or a you know some collaboration with a nonprofit entity? Because my thought was either we may you know. We Take the, as Councilor Lamarge said, the South Street model, where for the preferential lease, if there's a, a kind of collective entity that deals with actual maintenance, or we actually form something like an LLC um, that is able to take a more formal nonprofit role if that makes it easier for the city to actually sort of hand this off. I was just wondering about uh, the table's thoughts on that. The short answer is yes. And again, I want to reiterate the reason we're having these conversations is we're casting out for solutions as well. And um, we recognize the value of this asset as it's been described over and over again this evening that, that uh, you know, the prospect of this converting to some private enterprise that really doesn't necessarily have something that resonates with the neighborhood in order to the, you know, the, the best interests of the community at heart. Um, you know, principally breaking even would be fine. I think I'm, I'm not speaking for the mayor here, I'm speaking for myself. But I think um, that the issue is liability and fiscal liability and other liabilities. And the fact that while a million two doesn't seem like much, in a larger context, in all the other commitments and obligations and liabilities that we have, it's significant. It's, it's difficult to justify a larger conversation, which is why, I mean, this is as, as much of an appeal as it is a listening session, too. I'm heartened to hear personally from the community 
that this building contains uh, the level of emotion commitment to it. And I would be delighted and would do what I could personally to facilitate anything that would allow us to realize a solution here that literally allows the city to break even or something. Just to, and at the same time retain the more valuable features that, that have been described. So in that so, and I, 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 I've never heard anything represented to the contrary from anybody in, um, at this table. So, I mean, it's just, just to, you know, it's cold comfort, I suppose, at some level, but it's just so you know that we're not coming to you based, as I said, we already got a plan for this, and we already got it set up, and we got a kind of wire all lined up, and we're just paying lip service to hear This is not the case. Jingle. Uh, going away from thinking that I'm going to echo with Bill said, there's a fix in here because there's not. This is really, we would, it would be as difficult for me to let this building go. And what it, we also have to think too, this is all about economics. Two nights from now, we're going to have to go, this is about the taxpayers. Two nights from now, we're going to sit before the public and find out how we're going to do storm rain, how we're going to fix storm of that. We need money. It's all about the funding. Everything that we do is about funding. Um, and so if it does come out to be a break-even proposition without the city having to dump a lot of money into it, there's not just this room. Two nights from now, we're going to be before the entire city to ask them how we're going to fund uh, stormwater maintenance, which is falling apart across the city. Um, we've had, the city has been so generous in every override for any uh, capital expenditure, police station, high school, JFK, pools, you name it. So our responsibility, I, it's not, I think it's more of a, a responsibility to the taxpayer that we look at this and we invite everybody into the picture. Everybody has to come in and that's why we do this. This is in the infancy stages. We haven't, nobody's made a decision. We have to figure out just exactly how we can do this. And so us on the finance committee, it is all about economics and making it work. So if you're interested in any more of this, you can come to our meeting Thursday night at the JFK School and we'll talk about stormwater. Actually, I wish you would come uh, when we talk about that. We're talking about a, a mandated $100 million investment over 10 years. So, a, and it's, we as a community have to figure this out. So I invite people to come to that, it, unfortunately, there's not going to be quite as much kumbaya there as there is. <laughs> so, yeah, but it, I mean, JFK at 7 o'clock on Thursday evening. Come on, come on. Um, we, we, uh, we're, we have about seven minutes left um, for the time allotted, and I don't want to have anyone leave this room feeling that they haven't been heard. Is there someone who hasn't spoken that would like to say something? Yes. We have another no question, sure. There's a number on the building. When you call the number on the sign up front, it gives, it gives you, it's a general service number from North Hampton and asks you which department you want to speak to. David, what department do they want to speak to? Uh, we'll take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> which, it should not say Joe's Pizza. I'm sorry. Well, I, I know somebody that, that wanted to rent this hall and they called the number and of course they called Mike because they knew that he was the to be in the Any other questions? Um, thank you all. Uh, Justina, who didn't say it, um, was, it should, should be noted, uh, this, this meeting was in no small part due to her, her advocacy, so thank you. And I want to say thank you for coming here to speak to us because it's terrifying to, I've been here since 1998, teaching voice, I have a studio of 50 active people at any time. I've taught hundreds and hundreds in this valley. But the same situation as the dance studios and the Pilates studios, people coming from, from two hours in any direction to work with me, and so it brings a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of activity to this area. And 
you've heard how much this building means to us, and we're deeply grateful that you are willing to come out tonight and, uh, and, and really meet with us face to face and really talk about possibilities rather than to feel like it's over and, and you know, I'm going to have to teach out of my trunk. So, <laughs> so uh, we're very, very grateful that you're here and, and we're very excited to start to think about possibilities, how we can really redefine who we are because I think it's almost an identity crisis that we're looking at in a really positive way and, and to figure out how to make this a place that people do want to rent and do want to use and, and, and we're not unaware of finances being artists. <laughs> So thank you very much for coming. We're very well, grateful thank to you. have you here. And, and please remember that this is, as I said, as much of an appeal as it is a hearing. And, um, and we will we'll be glad to work with you and, and um, to find a solution for the best use of this so that reflects all the, all the values that you guys expressed tonight. So thank you again very much for coming. How will we go forward? Um, we have, again, we're passing on contact information. If you go to the website, there's ways to contact us. If you guys actually assemble or convene some type of meeting that you would like to meet one of us to attend and we're able to, we'd be glad to. Um, uh, I think clearly there are a number of ideas that have been floated. Um, and obviously, uh, the best response would be to the best proposal with the most amount of forethought that's gone into it. I mean, a lot of these things are just more, on some things that I heard tonight, a lot of people are just sort of grasping desperately at something, for something, but there are solid possible things that can be done, and whatever we do or you do, um, we will, you know, let's share all of it, okay? So, we're going to be meeting, um, we'll be meeting the fourth Tuesday of every month um, at five o'clock. We generally meet at the council chambers, so I'm assuming the, the committee will come again together on the fourth Tuesday. Um, and I think we're, um, I haven't, we haven't finalized it, but I, one of the issues I think we'll be discussing is that that outside appraisal or, or assessment that's been done professionally will be done by then. So that will probably be something we'll be looking at at that point as well. So. Yeah, so the, so the numbers will start to crystallize a little bit more. So. And it just so you know, we'll probably have an alternate meeting. Very devoted, yeah. pretty hardcore. <laughs> by, by the way, all, as I said, all the constituents on this side are an ad hoc committee, including the mayor, and we are your legislative body representatives on the finance committee. So we're actually representing two bodies in the meeting that he's talking about, the convening of the ad hoc committee, with purpose to discuss this building exclusively. I have one last question. Is it possible to have a chance to have a Well, this is a, a, I will say, though, we did, we did ask Robert Ross to that's, select that's some people. That's where the guilt comes in, because <laughs> We asked for suggestions for it, so that it's right back at you, Robert. So the tenants can attend those? Most definitely, yes. Yeah, so, so, so I was thinking that. But the, the, the nature of this committee is uh, the, the committee is going to make a recommendation. The recommendation the recommendation can be informed by the input. So you you are not going to be muted and your voice is not going to be um, ignored. So And the city council has the ultimate final we, that, that eventually falls on us and the other members of the council and uh, there's gonna be a lot of bites of this app before before any decisions. Task force meeting. I, I, I had said the fourth Tuesday, but obviously that's going to be Christmas, so we're going to have to reschedule. Uh, we've been on the finance committee. That's well, yeah, that's, yes. yeah. We, well, it's, it is also the finance committee meets that day, but we've been having these meetings on that fourth Tuesday, which is an off meeting um, uh, of the finance committee. So they've been meeting on those. Days. So it's, it's been the fourth Tuesday, but obviously for December we're going to have to reschedule it. So it's the next finance committee meeting is a council meeting.
we will not be discussing. So just sort of, but you're welcome to come to the public session and make comments there. At the beginning of the meeting, allows you plenty of time to get home before the meeting begins at 11 and 30. So, thank you all again. Thank you very much. Don't forget to see you all Thursday night.